Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, great to see all of you. Um, I wish everybody could be here, but uh, it's good to see you. And it's uh, uh, half of us were together all week, but but it's good to see all the others and see all of you back. I hope you had a spiritually blessed uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and uh, it's good to see you back safe. And of course, with these fall festivals, uh, we've just finished uh, envisioning a, uh, a hopeful future for all of mankind. Plus, we are reminded of the promise of salvation, not just for mankind, but for us when we were at uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Today, I would like to try and refresh us on the most basic basic concept of that salvation, and that of believing in Jesus Christ. Just really quickly, let's turn to John chapter 6, John chapter 6, this is a foundational understanding for salvation. John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. He goes on further in verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in Me, so this is Jesus Christ speaking, has everlasting life. For the benefit of this set of phrases, I want to take a quick look at the lives and general philosophies of two of our founding fathers. My intention is not to persuade you to necessarily admire these individuals, you probably do already, necessarily or as much as I do, but to explore briefly their life philosophies. One of these men, Thomas Jefferson, was an architect, an inventor, a collector, and could read at least five different languages. Besides this, he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, and he became the third president of the United States of America. The other individual, Ben Franklin, as America's Story website reports, was a very talented and involved statesman, printer, writer, scientist, inventor, civic leader, and diplomat. I believe he was the first postmaster general he was the ambassador to France. He, he did a lot of things, and he apparently did them pretty well. <clears throat> Franklin also was the only person, only one, to sign the three documents that established the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the peace treaty with Britain that ended the Revolutionary War, and also the Constitution. These two men, I believe, share something in common related to their life philosophy. They believed in an America that is established on biblical principles that define human rights and individual freedom. I do live in awe of their accomplishments, their contributions. I could only wish to communicate and influence a fraction as well as they could. They were quite an example. Yet, we need to look further into their philosophies to make sure we don't place them on too high a pedestal. Remember who we're talking about from the beginning here. Jesus Christ. Concerning Thomas Jefferson from Wikipedia, I'm going to read a series of things here. Please bear with me. The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth commonly referred to as the Jefferson Bible, was completed in 1820 by cutting and pasting with a razor and glue 
numerous sections from the New Testament as extractions of the doctrine of Jesus. I've done something similar myself. I'm not sure for the same reasons, though. Jefferson's condensed composition is especially notable for its exclusion of all miracles by Jesus and most mentions of the supernatural, including sections of the four Gospels that contain the resurrection and most other miracles and passages that portray Jesus as divine. Historian Edwin Scott Gostad explains, if a moral lesson was embedded in a miracle, like one statement has a moral lesson embedded in a miracle, the lesson survived in Jeffersonian scripture, but the miracle did not. Even when this took some rather careful cutting with scissors or razor, Jefferson managed to maintain Jesus' role as a great moral teacher, but not as a shaman or faith healer. Therefore, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth begins with an account of Jesus' birth without references to angels at that time, genealogy, or prophecy. Miracles, references to the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus, and Jesus' resurrection are also absent from his collection. Now, of course, this is someone else reporting this. I, I don't know of any references to the Trinity in the scriptures either. Uh, their recollection of it is that way. Encyc Encyclopedia Virginia states, an empiricist, now an empiricist is a person who believes you gain knowledge and understanding by the five senses. Okay. An empiricist, he believed that a rational and benevolent God was evident in the beauty and order of the universe. He professed Christianism, a belief in the morals taught by Jesus of Nazareth, but he rejected Jesus' divinity, resurrection, the atonement, and biblical miracles. He believed in God. He was a good man. Our second example, Ben Franklin, just weeks before he passed away, wrote a letter to Ezra Stiles where we read, You desire to know something of my religion. It is the first time I have been questioned upon it. I don't know whether he's saying doubted or just asked the question. It would seem like somebody would ask you about your religion somewhere on the line. But anyway, doubted or questioned. But I cannot take your curiosity amiss and shall endeavor in a few words to gratify it. Here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe that he governs by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service we render to him is doing good to his other children. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. That the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life respecting its conduct in this, which is a very common Christian belief. These I take to be the fundamental points in all sound religion, and I regard them as you do in whatever sect I meet with. As to Jesus of Nazareth, my opinion of whom you particularly desire, I think his system of morals and his religion, as he left them to us, the best the world ever saw or is likely to see but I apprehend it has received various corrupting changes. So he had concerns that some of the written word wasn't accurate. And I have, with most of the present dissenters in England, some doubts as to his divinity. These statesmen shared a common trait. They expressed a belief that there is one God and that his moral law is good, but both also shared unbelief or doubt in Jesus Christ as divine. In my mind, they offer multifaceted superior examples on how to think, uh, behave, uh, and effectively share their views with others. Yet, in light of the scriptures, 
those ones that I read to you earlier, I must put their contributions in perspective because the line they drew concerning Christ does actually disqualify them from a present salvation, from being saved now. Returning to the scriptures I previously shared, I'll share them with you again. John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him, in him whom he sent, whom the Father sent. Verse 47, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes, he has, who, he who, I'm sorry, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. No matter how wise, noble, or powerful an individual may prove to be, there was a third person I wanted to include, but didn't have time for him. And no matter how convinced they are that the word of God is for our good, without giving their lives to the Lord, Jesus Christ, they cannot reach their greatest human potential. We're reminded of this. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm always very encouraged by this group of scriptures. <laughs> For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. This isn't excluding this, these people. This means that not many are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. You can't go any lower than not. Some of us even have felt like that in our lives that we are nothing. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I have selected from Scripture three confessions, three confessions we must make to be saved. This is not expected to be all-inclusive, this is about confession. This is about things that we must attest to. So, so three, three confessions we must take, make to be saved because loving the law is actually not enough. It's even nothing if we do not understand our duty to accept Jesus Christ. Here are the three confessions, and they are in Scripture. Number one, Romans chapter 10, just back a few pages. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which, is, which we preach. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now that's not the only confession. Don't stop there. Many people do. Don't stop there. Number two, we'll go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, one, one book but previous. This is where Paul goes before Governor Felix. And he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, this is verse, chapter 24, verse 14, that according to the way they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. The very first song we sang today was, Oh, how I love I thy law. 
he believed all of this. It's funny because this is Paul saying this when the people use Paul to reject the law. So this confession he makes. And finally, the third confession. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Reading in verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll just quickly read James chapter 5, verse 16, which embellishes upon this, or adds to it, I should say. Confess your trespasses to one another. Mr. Walmsley did that earlier today, right before church. I'm not sure what he was confessing, but he confessed a trespass against a friend. And some, for some reason, they both started laughing after the confession. So confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. These three confessions, first, that Jesus is Lord, second, that we must worship God, believing all of God's word, and third, the confession of our sins, both to God and each other, for cleansing and healing, are imperative to our entering the kingdom of God. The result of this mindset and communication will then lead Jesus Christ, will lead Jesus Christ, I didn't say you and me, Jesus Christ to make his own confession on our behalf one day. So we'll end our instruction with this confession. And it's in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. He who overcomes, that's an important word in all of this discussion that I did not go into detail with, overcoming. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name, confess his name before my Father and before his angels.